please keep your open your Bible open to First Corinthians chapter ten. And uh, I have chosen Paul's three words in verse fourteen as the title of this sermon: "Flee from idolatry." He says, "Therefore, in verse fourteen, therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry." Now you would have thought Paul could have just quoted from what we commonly call the Ten Commandments. Which every Jew would know and memorize by heart, which says, "You shall not have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them." Now, it would not do. Justice to Paul, if we just fail to read the rest of the chapter, because in verse fourteen he says, "Therefore," so it reminds us. Well, what did he say before he comes to this sentence? Well, let us remind ourselves what Paul is saying、um, from chapter ten onwards. He was answering the questions put to him by the Christians in, at Corinth, the questions of to eat or not to eat, basically to do with idol food. There is food has been offered to idols or bought in the marketplaces, which has its origin from the temple, or or idol feast. So idol meat or idol feast. Now, as part of his answer, he deal with it in chapter eight. He said, "Look,、uh, with regards to idol meat, you need to exercise discernment carefully, and、uh, you need to exercise the spiritual principle of sometimes you may choose to give up your right to eat meat." For the sake of your weaker brother or sisters, out of Christian love, you don't want to stumble them. And then, in chapter ten, you know he did answer the question about idol feast, which we are going to come to later on. But in the middle of it, he says, "Look, flee from idolatry." Now, so we are going to look at his warning. Why is it so important and so crucial for the Christians? And secondly, you will notice in chapter ten, other than these two or four, three words, "flee from idolatry," he actually developed certain principles which are helpful to them and to us too, which I would summarize as the danger of overconfidence. We shall look at it later on when we look at the first part between verse one to verse thirteen, and then the other equally serious things is the danger of compromise. So let's look at his warning in verse six. He says, "These things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things, as they did." Now, so Paul turned their mind to the history. He said, "Look, something happened, you know,、uh, in the lives of our ancestors, and they were punished by God on the matter of idolatry. So they were written." And recorded for our benefit too. In verse eleven, these things happened. What are these things? God's judgment happened to them as examples, and were written down as a warning for us, on whom the fulfilment of the ages has come. So, before we come to the therefore, flee from idolatry. Let's look at how these. Danger of overconfidence comes about. Now, in the background of eating idol meat, some Christians 
are pretty confident that, look, we are safe to eat anything because idols are just non-existence. They're just a piece of stone or wood carved and placed in a temple. So therefore, they feel that they are saved because they have been baptized, because they have observed the Holy Communion. So with these two sacraments, they have been set apart. We hold the same view, don't we? In the sacrament of baptism, it conveys the spiritual reality and the meaning of we are in Christ. When we take part in the Holy Communion, we are not just sitting there to look at it. We just, you know, we have to take part in it. And that's why we invite Christians to take part. So, in the mind of the Christians, or some Christians at Corinth, you think, look, we are baptized, we are in Christ, and we take Holy Communion to convey that we take part in this feast. We belong to Christ. We, symbolically, when we take the bread and the cup, we receive Jesus into our lives. So, nothing can come, nothing harm can come to us. So Paul, in his reply, took them right back to their history. And he said in verse 1, For I do not want you to be ignorant of this fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the clouds and they all passed through the sea. And they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In other words, Paul said, look, look at our ancestors. They were baptized too. Hang on. Did they get baptized? Paul said, look, <clears throat> in a way, they did. And he explained in that way. Look, when God rescued their ancestors from the hands of the Egyptians through Moses, the entire generation experienced God in a most wonderful way. God guided them in the day through clouds as a protection from the uh, severe sun as well as to guide away. At night there was fire to keep them warm and to warn the animals away from them. Supernatural. Wherever they go, the cloud and the fire followed them. And then in verse 2, when they went through the sea, it refers to definitely the crossing of the Red Sea. When they were being chased by the Egyptians, they came to the Red Sea and no, no turning back because, you know, they can't go forward. And God separated the water so that they can walk on the sea, on the dry with all the water sort of separated and stopped in the middle, leaving them a clear path to walk across. Now, so we read it. It is in Exodus chapter 14. I remember when I was young and I looked, uh, watched the Ten Commandments, I was marvel at the, of course, the camera trick, but how the water sort of went back and gave way, a clear way for the, for the Israelites to walk through. So Paul is saying, look, they were not baptized in our same way, like going into the water and come out one by one, normally. But they, as a people, they went through the same experience with cloud over them and water around them, and they were baptized in that sense, you know, symbolically. Now, when we're baptized, we're baptized into Christ because we're saved through Christ. So Paul is saying, look, our ancestors were saved by God through Moses. So therefore, you know, he makes a connection. They were all baptized into Moses because they had this extraordinary experience 
through God's chosen servant, Moses, as we do, Christians, when through baptism, through God's only Son, Jesus, through faith in Him. So their physical experience under the cloud and passing, the through, passing through the water was like Christians' experience being immersed into the water and coming out of the water in water baptism. Now, these are important and significant events. And uh, in verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. And they drink from they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that was rock, and that rock was Christ. Now Paul is saying, look, when they were in the wilderness, what did they survive on? Food. Who provided them the food? God. In the form of manna. Now, when this is spiritual food, it's better to be understood as supernatural food. Because spiritual food gives us the idea or the impression that it is food for our spirit. Right? Something sort of not a matter, you know, not tangible. But they were physical food. They were told to collect them in the morning. They came home and cooked for them. Uh, and uh, Incidentally, it's interesting, on Sabbath, Jesus, uh, God said to them, look, you rest, you observe, and kept Sabbath holy. So, don't go out. There won't be any manna on the Sabbath. But on the day before, you can collect a double portion. And uh, so, they did. But on a normal day, if there's any leftover manna for the next day, Guess what? They went bad. But on the day before Sabbath, you know, they were told to take a double portion and, you know, one portion is for the food on that day, and the rest of it would not go bad. Now, it's amazing, isn't it? In those days, there's no refrigerator. It was clearly God's wonderful provision. God has a message for his people. You rely on me every day for your provision. Jesus said in this same, in the Lord's Prayer, we ask God, give us our daily bread. Now, so Paul is saying, look, when they ate this supernatural food manna, they drank this supernatural drink, water from the rock. Now again, it was recorded in in Exodus as well as in uh, Numbers, there were occasions when the Israelites came to a place and there was no water. And they started to blame Moses. They said, look, it's you! You were the, uh, the, the problem. And uh, we could have lived in Egypt and enjoy ourselves. Good food, garlic, and uh, wonderful herbs plenty of drinks, but here we have this boring manner. And now we don't have water to drink. And guess what God said to Moses? Look, turn to the rock. And from the rock came water. Now, supernatural. Now here, Paul says, the spiritual rock that accompanied them. Now again, please understand when Paul wrote this, he's using a symbolic uh, a picture language. Don't imagine as they travel, there is a magical rock. Follow them everywhere. But again, uh, again the, the message was clear. Wherever they go, God sees to their need. They are not short. And they all provided for. And then Paul said, this rock was Christ. Now, again, don't imagine there was Christ impersonating as a piece of rock. Right. But in the symbolic language, the rock is referring to God. In the Old Testament, 
God of is our rock of salvation. Right. So Paul, in his New Testament day, looking back, right, he's making a parallel comparison between Christian experience and what the Jewish ancestors has experienced. He said, look, when we observe the Holy Communion, right, we're being fed by Christ. We take the bread and the cup symbolize the body of the Lord. But still a piece of bread. There's still water or drink, in our case, uh, fruit juice. In some churches, uh, 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 alcohol, wine, fruit wine. But symbolically, when we take these elements, we are saying we are being fed through Christ. Now, so Paul is saying, look, even though Christ did not exist, what they went through that experience is very similar to what we are going through in our Christian experience through baptism and Holy Communion. And then after he made that parallel, then he said, in verse 5, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with them. Well, why did God change his mind? Why did God suddenly got fed up with his people? I mean, after all, God made this covenant with this group of Israelites or Hebrews in those days. Uh, they were known as, and uh, but the point is, despite the sacred privileges in kind to ours, Paul said, our ancestors were rejected by God. They had the experience of passing through the water and the cloud in the same way as we have in our experience through baptism. They have the experience of being nourished with this spiritual, supernatural food, as we did in our Holy Communion. God was not pleased with them, and they were punished and died in the wilderness without entering the land which God has promised them. <coughs> What's the lesson? Paul simply says, look, even though their ancestors experienced a kind of baptism, a kind of the Lord's Supper, yet the majority experienced God's judgment. Now, he's not, he's not referring to their eternal lost. He's not talking about eternal life here. But he's saying, look, God's judgment fell on them and they died without entering the promised land. So therefore, do not be so overconfident on your baptism or your communion as your, as it were, trump card. You know, when we play Monopoly, I often like to have the get out of jail card. Because when you're in trouble, place a card, get out of jail free. Now, so in the mind of some Christians at Corinth, the fact that they have been baptized and they part in Holy Communion gives them this force of security and they are so confident that oh, I belong to God and idols are nothing. They can't touch me. Food is just food. So therefore, nothing could go wrong with me. Now, so Paul is saying, don't be so sure. Now, before we go any further, let's, uh, let's ask ourselves, <clears throat> is overconfidence something that other people would have trouble with? What about ourselves? The Bible says, do not worship idols. The Bible says, do not commit adultery. So keep away from sexual immorality. Or the Bible says, do not put God in a test. In other words, you know, don't think that, you know, God has sort of 
given you um, a bad life, and then or you try to test God's patience by living the way you choose. Well, God's patience sometimes can run out in certain cases, like this. Or are you so confident that you say, I never grumble, I never make any complaint to God? Do we? When times are hard, when you seem to think that, you know, well, other people seem to get the blessings, but I seem to be left behind. You complain that God said, well, God, it's not fair. Where are you? Now, don't put up your hand. I'm not asking for answer. So Paul is saying, look, if you're so confident that you do not do this, then you look at these people, look at our ancestor. So he took them back to the history. Now these things occurred as an example to keep us from falling the same, falling the same way. Verse seven: Do not be idolater. But as some of them did, our ancestors did. Do not commit adultery, as some of them did. It refers to. The occasions where when Moses has gone up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God, or instructions as well, what did the people do? So look, we don't know where that Moses guy has gone. Maybe he has deserted us. Maybe you know, he has lost his way. Maybe he has been eaten by some wild animals. And they asked Aaron to cast a golden calf and said, look, make us something that we can worship and, uh, and lead us on. So they turned to idol worship, right? Verse 7, even they sat down and each and got up indulged in barbary. Now here, it's not referring to just having a party to celebrate yeah, in front of the golden calf. It refers to the act of worship in adultery. Now, as you, uh, as uh, the Greek culture um, uh, um, sort of gives us details, like the worship in certain pagan temples involves adultery. They are temple prostitutes. And um, so they were acting in such a sinful, corrupted way Verse 8, we should not commit adultery, but they did. <clears throat> In verse 9, you should not test Christ. Really, we don't, we shouldn't. But as some of them did, they test God's patience. And they were killed by snakes. Now again, it refers to a clear account recorded in the Old Testament. And uh, when they make complaints and uh, and um, and uh, snakes came and killed many of them, until until Moses pleaded for for them in uh, to God, and God said, "Look, put this snake on a pole, and you hold it up." Whoever look at it, and they will be healed, and they will be saved. Now again, it happened because it was recorded for us, and the Jews knew that they memorized this event. But that also points to the Jesus who was crucified and nailed on the cross. Anyone who looked on him, anyone who turned to Christ, will be saved. Verse 10, do not grumble, but some of them did. And uh, when, when they were near the promised land, they sent out spies and they came back. Most of them said, oh, no, we couldn't go there. There were giants there, we'd be killed. Only two people, that's Joshua and Caleb gave a different report and said, look, it's a good land. It's what God has promised us. 
Let's go. No, no, no. They trusted by their sense, by their sight, by their own wisdom, by their assessment, rather than God who says clearly, that is for you. I've kept it for you. And uh, so what did they do? They ended up walking around in the, in the wilderness for 40 years until the whole generation of people who came out of Egypt died. So here the point Paul was making, look, God was not pleased with them, even though they were baptized, even though they had spiritual food in a form, in a way similar to us, but yet, but yet God could not tolerate their adultery. God could not adulterate the sin of sexual sin. God could not, cannot tolerate their testing of God's patience. God could not tolerate their constant grumbling against God. So Paul is saying, in the same way, God will not tolerate the Christians at Corinth in their idolatry, in their sexual immorality, in their grumbling, in their testing of God. Now, so I think this is clearly the danger of overconfidence. I think that can happen to us today. We can be so confident with, you know, with the fact that I'm a baptized Christian. I have, I have observed the Holy Communion regularly. And uh, every now and again, I do come to church to get my stamp like a visa, right? When the visa expired after a certain time or the passport expired after 10 years. I do go regularly to have baptism is once but have Holy Communion. I must be all right. God said, look, no, no, no. Look at them. Okay. But then in verse 6 and 11, these are the warnings Paul has given to the Christians at Corinth. But then he went on and said, look, if you, are stand, if you think that you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. But, but after the warning, gives the encouragement. But when you fall, do not give excuse and claim that, well, this is beyond what I can bear. Look, this experience is not something that you guys have gone through. This is a exceptional case, so don't blame me. Paul said, look, no, what you are going through in terms of tests or temptations are common, are experience that other people have gone through too. But God is faithful. He will help you. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. In other words, if you are only a primary school child, God will not give you a test from a university degree ex uh, examination. Right? God will not test us beyond what we can bear. But when we are tempted, when we are put to test, God will also help us and to provide a way out so we can endure it. We can come out victoriously. I think that's a wonderful promise and encouragement by our God who loves us so much. So let's move on from the danger of overconfidence to the danger of compromise. In verse 14 and 15, Paul said, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. Well, what, prom what compromise he's referring to? Now, he's referring to how they compromise their faith 
by taking part in the Holy Communion at, at the same time taking part in the idol feast. Remember, idol food. You need to exercise careful judgment. And uh, idol feast. No, you shouldn't go. Have no part in it. But before he made that clear statement, he said in verse 15, he said, look, judge for yourself. Firstly, he explained what Holy Communion is all about in verse 16. Is it not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ? And is it not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Paul is saying, look, in the act of, in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Nowadays, you know, we have different forms of bread. In the old days, we have bread, sometimes baked, you know, without any flour, so it is unleavened. And uh, sometimes out of convenience, we have uh, a piece of, you know, sliced bread. And uh, nowadays, we can buy a wafer bread. Right, we don't need to, we don't need to do any cutting. They all come separately, round and uh, easy to pick up and easy to digest, and it melts in your mouth. But Paul is saying, look, <clears throat> though we are different people, yet when we gather around the Lord's table, we all take part in it, <laughs> right? So we are part of this in the act of receiving Christ into our lives. We are not doing it individually. We are in it all together, share the one loaf. And in this participation, we become one with Christ. Right? As the bread and the drink becomes one of us, uh, one in us, rather. Then Paul said, look, Consider the people of Israel, do not those who eat the sacrifices, participation in the altar, then do I mean that food sacrifice to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, idol is an idol, but you don't know what's behind it, what it signifies through this act of eating the meal in, you know, in this idol feast. He said, look, by taking part in the eating of that feast, you become part of that people. Yes, you are not there just as a participant or attendee or someone who just observes. You become part of what it goes on. You're involved in that religious and dark force. So Paul said, look, so the food, the sacrifice made to the pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I want you, I don't want you to be participants with demons. In verse 21, he said, look, judge for yourself. Can you both, can you be both? Can you drink the cup of the Lord and then turn around and drink the cup of demons? You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? In other words, are you trying to upset God? Now here, the word jealousy is not the jealousy that we refer to, well, look, I'm jealous because you got more than me. Jealousy refers to a relationship between husband and wife. It is, a, it is a devotion, a love, which you give solely to your spouse and no one else. And this is the love that God wants from his people. You love me and you remain loyal and faithful to me, not to someone else. Right? 
Rightly so. If your wife or oh, sorry, no, sorry, no, no. <laughs> if a wife right turns to another man, the husband have the right to say that look, it's not on. I'm your husband. You should love me, not the other man. And equally, right, the wife can say to the man, look. I won't allow you to have a relationship with another woman because I'm your wife. Now, so it is that kind of jealousy we are talking about in the Bible, when we refer to God is a jealous God, right? God is not someone who looked at our table and said, "Eh, hey, you know, you shouldn't have that." No, God is saying, "Look, is your heart for me? Is your love for me alone?" Right? So. Here, in short, Paul is saying to the Christians at Corinth, "Say, so look, you can't have it both ways, because some people attempted to make a compromise, right? I mean, they might say, 'Well, look, it is a feast held in a temple, and it is a social gathering. It was so in those days.'" They don't have public places like restaurants, or a civil center, or community center for you to hire. When the place at home is not big enough to entertain, most people therefore go to the temple, and sometimes they do have temple feasts as well. So, Paul is saying, look, you can't have it. Both way, you cannot celebrate the idol feast, and yet at the same time, you know, celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now, so what is the message for us? We turn around and say, "Look, there's no danger because there's no temple here, uh, or we won't be invited to a temple for a temple feast." Well, perhaps in our modern days, our our idols do not just appear in the form of a piece of stone or a piece of object. The Bible makes it very clear: any thing, any object, any person, anything that we have created with our hand or imagination or your desire, that is. Put before God, above God, then that person, that object, that desire becomes your idol. Now, sometimes these idols are harmless, and that's why we are so tempted to say, "Look, there's some grey area." For example. Our modern idols could be in a form of identity. I need to keep my name, my honor, or the name of my family. Now, if we put that above God, then your honor, your family name, becomes an idol. Or money. We can never do without money. Money simply is. Exchange of labor, basically, but right, we need money to go out. We need money to pay for food. It is it is necessary, but yet the love of money is the root of all evil, right? So money, material things, possessions can become so obsessive and has taken over our heart and becomes an idol in itself. Job, career, they're neutral, they're harmless. In some senses, they're necessary. Right? We need a job to pay for our bills. We we need a job because we feel there's a contribution we can make. It gives us satisfaction as well. <coughs> Great, but if that job, if that career. Has become something that is above God, and that ambition, that desire to go further, has become your personal obsession. 
and becomes an idol, or entertainment, or any other, or, or any other items which you think it is necessary, could be your television, could be some programs which you have pleasure in, but if it has taken over your life, beware, that may become your idol. And so, what have we covered today? I think I'd like to sum up. On this matter of idolatry, Paul lay out some dangers, potential dangers, that we must avoid. The first one is overconfidence. We can never, never hide ourselves behind baptism and Holy Communion and say that I will be okay. Or I have done enough Christian, uh, Christian ministry. I have clocked up enough credits. I must be saved in God's book. I have given so much. And some people say, look, I have transferred my earthly account to God's account. I must be okay. Or sometimes we're tempted to say, look, I know where the line is. I'll never cross that line. Now, if that is the thinking of a person who is overconfident, then a person who is a compromised person is someone who thinks, well, there is always a grey area. I don't need a line. I know where the grey area is. I'll be okay. So if someone who is overconfident and also like to make compromise will say, look, I know it is safe in this grey area. I know it's safe. Well, sometimes we feel that, well, I'm a mature Christian. Look, I have enough Bible knowledge. I have spiritual discernment. I have Christian experience in ministry. I have these supernatural gifts as well, spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit. Surely, I can allow myself some room for some unholy habits. Surely, I have built in enough credits on many Sundays. I went to church, not only for my baptism. I've got my visa renewed, my passport renewed every time when I go for the Holy Communion. And surely, I can afford to let my hair down a little on some occasions, maybe on these grey areas. You see what I mean? It's so easy to slip into this kind of thinking. Maybe grey areas in many cases, and there are some grey areas, but make sure it is not a sin. It is not in darkness. Because when it comes to God, there is no place for compromise with His holiness, with His lordship. God doesn't share his place with any idols, any form of idols, any darkness, because it's light. God will not accept anything that is sinful because he's holy. So as we face every day, yes, we have to make choices. And some of them can come in a subtle way because we're tempted to Perhaps say, I'd be all right. Well, this is a grey area. Temptations will always come to us in many forms and say, look, it's okay to sort of cut a corner. You always can come back to God in a, you know, in a roundabout way. But I'd like to finish with the verse, verse 13 of this chapter. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Don't give excuses and say, look, this is a unique, this is a personal 
situation, which is different to others. No, don't give yourself any excuses in your temptation or in facing temptation. But God is faithful and just. God is our gracious Father. Yes, He's watching us, not to come to us with a big stick. He's watching over us to help us out. Turn to Him, right? He will not let you be tested or tempted beyond what you can bear. His grace is in need, indeed sufficient for us in all circumstances. And He will provide a way out that we can cross it. We can get through it. We can come out victoriously. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word of warning and encouragement. Lord, we confess to you that many, many, many times we are tempted to think that we are okay. We are confident because of what we have done or what we have achieved. Lord, we pray that you take away our pride and help us to rely and depend on you solely and entirely for strength, for spiritual battle. Lord, we also pray that you help us to stand up against the attraction of the world. Lord, we pray that when we come to the crunch, we will not seek to make a compromise over our faith. Lord, keep our heart devoted to you. Lord, keep our eyes fixed on you. Keep our love for you burning every day. Help us, Lord, in our everyday life. In Jesus' name. Amen.